Okay, well, thank you, uh, Reams. Thank you for, and hello to you all. Uh, my name is Dr. Merrill. Thank you for uh, inviting me here to talk today. It's actually a great pleasure of mine to be involved in such a great uh, event, and, and it's so great to see all the, the energy here in the room of everybody interested in this topic and, and getting information. So I'm just going to take a, a few minutes of your time so we'll have plenty of time left at the end for the question and answer because you know I've done a fair number of, of events and my favorite part is the question and answer. So in any case, I'm a psychiatrist. I trained at UCLA. Uh, before that, I trained in neuroscience and actually did some work in, in stem cells and neurodegenerative disorders. But in any case, that's another story. Um, nowadays, I see outpatients and inpatients. I have a fair number of uh, stroke survivors as, as patients. And that, that is how I came to be acquainted with Reams in terms of my, my work at UCLA, seeing outpatients and helping them in their recovery. So I just wanted to spend a few minutes going over from the psychiatric and psychological end of things how, how, how I've been able to view stroke and how it's been able to help me help patients and their families. So as you all know, not all strokes are created equal. There are different types of strokes. There's large vessel strokes, small vessel strokes, strategic strokes, cortical strokes, subcortical strokes, strokes that are all over. You get the point. There's a lot of different types of strokes. And not everybody has the same deficits from stroke, not only physically, but also mentally and cognitively. So it's kind of stating the obvious, but I just wanted to point that out, that like it's, it's really clear from any person, if you look across the room, it's, it's really easy to pick up a physical deficit. But it's not so easy to, to know going into things what the emotional and cognitive deficits are going to be that, that you're going to face and that your family's going to face. And so, you know, how do you begin to approach this? Well, you can look at more severe cases where unfortunately the stroke damage has been more, more extensive. And, and so in severe cases of stroke or, or a series of strokes, we can see a vascular cognitive impairment, which if it's functionally impairing in everyday living, that, that's what we would call a dementia syndrome. In those sorts of cases, uh, we've observed a slowness of thinking. We've also seen that quite commonly there's what's, there's so-called executive dysfunction. And it's a bit self-explanatory, you know, the CEO of the brain, the executive function, how, you know, what executive dysfunction means. It's, it's decision making, you know, keeping your mood stable in the face of stress, and then also uh, being motivated to do things. So, so we see that that's impaired with more severe cases of stroke. And um, relatively speaking, I also have trained in the world of Alzheimer's disease. With stroke, there's a relative preservation of memory. But as the question that Dr. Dobkin pointed out, it, there's a relative preservation. I mean, people notice problems with memory following many different strokes. So, but it doesn't end there. So that was just cognition. Beyond cognition, there's impacts of strokes organically on, on behavioral aspects of living. So this is from a large study of populations. And the most common thing that happens following stroke organically is, is, a, is a depressive syndrome or depression. People who were perfectly you know, emotionally stable and had never had any personal history of depression after stroke, they exhibit depressive syndromes. And it goes right down through the list of all sorts of different psychological syndromes that can happen. Agitation, being, being apathetic, being quite irritable, anxious, even things like hallucinating, no longer being able to inhibit or stop what you're going to say in public, you know, very embarrassing, potentially embarrassing things, being delusional, you know, paranoid, suspicious. So as a psychiatrist, I have a bit of a biased sample. I, I end up seeing a lot of patients who exhibit this sort of thing, because otherwise they don't need to see a psychiatrist. But um, suffice it to say, it's very confusing, because one person with a stroke won't have any of this, and another person with a stroke, you know, oh my gosh, they may have all of it. And how do you start to untangle what's happening in the brain? Well, it takes years of training. Luckily, I have done some fellowship training here at UCLA. I've worked with some of the leaders in the field in um, cognitive disorders and thinking, among them Dr. Cummings and Dr. Mendez, who have developed these models, these models of cognition that are, that are a little bit more complex than our, than our charge here today to understand. But suffice it to say, they're very organically based 
brain circuits that exist which control emotions and in control thinking and with stroke you can get damage at different parts these each box represents a different part of the brain sometimes the same part in a circuit and in a stroke you can get damage in one part you can get damage in another part you can get damage in different systems and what ends up happening is depending on the circuit involved you get a different phenotype or you get a different manifestation so one person with a stroke may be very amotivated or may be very apathetic so you're like you're thinking what's wrong with this person they used to get up and go now they got up and went you know, somebody else it may be they used to be a CEO and now they're basically just they're ready to take orders like they can't it's too much to handle and so it's not all in people's heads well not the way you might think it is actually in their head it's in the brain but point being it's very organic it's not made up it's not psychological so this is the first half of the message I wanted to give you today which is the brain is a very delicate instrument and can be disrupted cognitively and emotionally from stroke and there are ways to get help with this and ways to get help with dealing with it the second half of the message I wanted to convey to you that after I just said it's not all in your head it actually there are psychological reactions to illness that that happen commonly and include the type of reactions people have to stroke so even if these complex brain circuits are not impacted even if they're still intact following a stroke you can very well have a psychological reaction to having a stroke that reaches the threshold of clinical significance again the most common phenomenon are depression and anxiety but there's a whole host of other psychological reactions that can help with happen when becoming severely medically ill like going through a major stroke with depression we see mood changes sadness and grief which can lead to things like giving up or even becoming suicidal you can have so-called vegetative symptoms essentially things you can observe where there's a loss of appetite leading to weight loss and constipation or people's energy can go down or they can have trouble sleeping suddenly leading to fatigue and, and even weakness and you can see that some of these aspects are things that you need for a good recovery all of the, these things above can be seen not only in medical illnesses but also within stroke psychologically what are the sources of depression it's well appreciated that depression can come or be caused by a number of different uh, stressors or onslaughts so you can have loss of body parts or even just loss of function of body parts leading to depression you can have a perceived or actual loss of control or loss of independence leading to depression you can lose the role that you were in in relationships or you can lose the relationship altogether winding up depressed also people facing chronic pain tend to get depressed as do those who end up feeling guilty about what's going on the punchline here again all of the above can be seen with stroke so hopefully you're starting to see that there's both organic causes of mood symptoms and stroke and then there's also psychological causes of symptoms and strokes the good news for both of those things is that there's ways to get help even if you've never had mental health treatment before it's very reasonable to the, at the very least go for a consultation with a psychologist or psychiatrist following a stroke to get the opinion and to get the information about potential interventions with any evaluation I start I try to start with listening and understanding this really tends to encourage expression of what's going on and even just expressing what's going on can be quite helpful as as I work through uh, the intervention for psychological reactions to illness I offer I try to offer very specific and realistic reassurances uh, trying to really rely on those constructive specific plans for practicing um, mobilizing support systems that are viable and existent things like support groups for example doing this sort of thing can really combat the learned helplessness that tends to kick in if you don't start to see results or don't start to get help if it gets to a point where symptoms are very severe you might consider even trying out medications for stroke recovery that would address things like depression and anxiety so a couple words about anxiety and then I promise I'll wrap up anxiety can lead to very significant symptoms following stroke in general when somebody has what we know commonly as a panic attack there are three major symptom clusters that happen 
The first is cardiac type symptoms, things like a racing heart, actual chest pain or sweating. The second syndrome or the second area is respiratory symptoms. So feeling short of breath, having a choking sensation or tingling in your extremities. The third realm of this uh, panic-like attacks is the psychological impact. Feeling like you're losing control or even feeling like you're dying. Now the problem here is that these sort of attacks mimic medical illness and they can interfere with recovery. Just like depression, there are a number of sources of anxiety. Things like fear of death, abandonment, or strangers. Suddenly, you're medically ill. You have to interact with people like doctors, scary doctors. No psychiatrists, I don't wear a tie, I don't wear a white coat, just to help people stay relaxed, basically. Um, so it is a very anxiety-producing thing to go through being ill and trying to recover. Anxiety, it's like there's a plus side and there's a minus side. We've all survived to this day because we have some level of anxiety. You know, the lion didn't eat us. The tiger didn't eat us. Our fight or flight reactions have kicked in to keep us alive as a species, as in, as, including as individuals. We haven't gotten run over by a bus. Um, so there are adaptive components to feeling anxious and um, being on alert. On the other hand, excessive anxiety can become maladaptive. It can really have people become shut in and, and you know, basically remain homebound to the point where they can't engage in their recovery. So there's unnecessary invalidism, that's a long hard word for me, but where people just basically give up. You can become paralyzed with fear, and in extreme cases, the physiologic triggers that are related to anxiety can actually become dangerous, things like persistent elevated blood pressure. So just like with depression, the core of the intervention for anxiety is listening and exploring what the causes are. I can list off a whole laundry list of why you're anxious, but I don't know which ones are the case for you. So finding out what's involved is very important. This avoids misunderstanding. This avoids doing the old, oh, don't worry, you know, you're going to be all right. Everything's going to be fine. I mean, in the end, I think that's true, but it's hard to get to that place, and you need professional help, and you need to put in the effort and the practice, like Dr. Dobkin was talking about. Just like for physical recovery, you need to have the same level of intensity of intervention for psychological and emotional recovery. So, as we were learning about drug trials and, and research, right now, basically, the pharmacological interventions are so-called the dirty word off-label. Um, I don't inject people in the spine or anything like that, but I do talk to people about what the options are and what the evidence or lack of evidence is for different treatments. You know, if it, if it looks like depression, sounds like depression, it is depression. Well, at some point, I may try an antidepressant with someone. Um, I may also, if it floats your boat, I may send them for meditation or acupuncture or you know, group therapy, individual therapy. It really just depends um, because there's not only medication interventions, there's also the psychological and social interventions that really make a big difference and can really help speed and fortify your recovery. So in conclusion, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral disturbances are common after stroke. The psychological reactions that happen are a normal part of reaction to serious illness, including stroke. Medication trials and psychotherapy can be helpful, especially if the symptoms are persistent and functionally impairing. And a comprehensive mind-body treatment enhances your recovery and ultimately your daily function. Thank you.